All right, gang, here we go. This is for physics unit eight, part five. We're talking about refraction and Snell's law. All right, so up to this point in our study of light, we've talked about properties of light. We've talked about how they add together to make colors. And we also talked about how they reflect off of boundaries, right? Or specifically, we did a lot with mirrors. So we had, you know, some sort of mirrored surface and our ray would come in hit the surface and then bounce off, right? And then uh, we had the normal like this. And then so this angle here was our incidence angle. And then we defined this angle here as our reflected angle, right? Or uh, our, our angle of reflection, right? And so these two angles would always be equal to each other based off this. And so that's kind of where we're at now. Um, but the fact is, if you're not hitting something that's purely reflective, like a mirror, completely opaque, like a wall, then you have what occurs. You also have this additional ray that bounces uh, because of this incidence, it, and it's called the refracted ray. And so it's an additional ray that gets bounced off through this thing here. And so if you've ever seen, like, uh, you know, the trick where you or like the little optical illusion where you have a cup of water and then you stick a pencil you know, or, you know, some sort of stick in this cup, and it looks like the pencil get, is broken, right, as it passes through this cup. That's essentially where we're at, right? So this is the pencil that was in the cup, and then it looks like it's it's broken, and that's because as this light passes through this barrier change here, it actually changes its angle. It changes its direction. It gets refracted, and that's because uh, we've had a little bit of a sneezing tree so far, in that we've all we've said that all light travels at 3.0 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second that's not quite true light will actually change speeds as it travels through different mediums uh, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth is the maximum speed that light can have but uh, it can go slower than that depending on the optical density of what it's traveling through all right so let's talk about why this occurs so let's think about this for a second if you're pushing a lawnmower uh, you know along this pavement here right and then this wheel here hits this ground grass, you know that this wheel is going to slow down. This wheel here is going to slow down as it comes into the grass based on how it was going before. And because of that, this wheel will be going slower than this one. And so it's going to start to veer, right? So your, your uh, lawnmower will veer this way until this wheel hits this grass as well. And now they'll be moving at the same speed and it'll move in a straight line going this way, right? So it was coming this way, right then this part slows down because it's hitting and then it curves and comes in this way all right and so essentially this is exactly what happens with light we have light that comes in and then when one part of it strikes the barrier where it travels slower it's going to start turning it's going to change the direction it's going to veer off to the side all right and that's essentially uh, what happens when thing, when our light gets refracted. It's by changing the speed of our uh, electromagnetic radiation. All right. So here's you know here's our ray diagrams for what's going on. All right. And so we've we've done up above this grass layer or the grass this glass layer. We this is essentially what we focused on in this idea of reflection off of a, a mirror. And now we're introducing the idea of well, what if our uh, boundary is you know uh, not opaque or not a complete mirror and so now we get this refraction so really light rays will both reflect and refract at the same time okay and then we have these two rules here if the light slows down it's going to bend towards the normal line so here uh, light travels slower in glass than it does in air and so the light as it comes in is going to travel slower Okay, it hits this, refracts, travels slower, and it's going to bend towards the normal line. Remember, the normal line is the stashed line here. And because it traveled towards the, or it bent towards the normal line, just like the, the grass with the lawnmower. The lawnmower was slower in the grass, so it's bent, it bent towards that normal line when that occurs. All right. Um, if the if it's the opposite is what's true, then your glass uh, or you're traveling to a faster medium, then it's going to bend away from the normal. Okay, and so you have uh, this thing here. So you're traveling from glass to air. It travels faster in air, so when it refracts, uh, this part here is going to speed up the side on this, so it's going to push it over to the side to the you know to our right. All right, and so this refracted angle is going to be bigger than the incident angle. All right, um, and we always, always, always measure this angle in regards to the normal line. That's going to be very important here coming up with regards to Snell's law. Okay, the other thing that's interesting is to notice that these light rays are reversible. That means that really we could go either way and they'd work if we took this light and we showed it here at this angle, it would get refracted along this line here, and then it would be, uh, you know, 
the reflected angle would be over here. So really, we could go either direction with these. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So how does light bend? Well, the wave front, so remember, let's take a step back here for a second. Remember when uh, we talked about waves, we, t we I drew this little flashlight and we, you know, we drew uh, light waves that would come out as a, you know, sine waves that would come out like this. And we talked about how, well, if we drew a line that connected all of our crests, right? So we drew a line like this, and then we drew another line that was our crest here. Okay, and then you're going to see my artistic potential was not high. So you can see that these guys, and remember these lines here are the wave fronts. Okay, and so that's what we're looking at here is we have these wave fronts. Um, and we can see that this kind of allows us to picture what's going on. So we, so, uh, so as these wave fronts move, the edge that hits the glass first is going to slow down. So uh, this wavelength was a lot bigger. See how the wavelength is a lot longer between these wave fronts here, and then as it gets into the slower glass, uh, the wavelength is shorter. And that makes sense because we know that the speed of a wave, right? The speed of a wave is equal to the the wavelength times the frequency, right? Well, the frequency is going to be the same because it's coming from the same source, but the wavelength is going to change because we're changing mediums, all right? <clears throat> and so the wavelength has to get smaller in order to make the speed slower, okay? And so this guy here is going to slow down and these wavelengths get closer together, so the wavelengths are shorter. And so notice again that our total velocity, or our, like if we were going to draw a ray here, this ray vector would go off in this direction with the velocity of the air, and then the velocity of the glass would get pointed out down here. Uh, I recommend, you know, typing this video in here and looking at this guy here. They do a, a really good job. It's just it's essentially the same thing, but it's animated, and you can kind of see what's going on. All right. So this leads us to the law of refraction. This kind of this allows us to kind of quantify exactly well how much slower is the light in this new medium. All right, and essentially it's just a ratio. It's the ratio of the speed of light in the vacuum versus the speed of light in the medium. Okay, and it's always it's this value n. And it's called the index of refraction, and it's the speed of light over the speed of light in the medium. All right, so uh, the speed of light in the vacuum is always going to be as fast as it can go. Okay, come on. Oh, I guess it just kind of hung up on me. Okay, so it's this uh, ratio. Our c will always be this value here. It's defined as that's the speed of light in the vacuum, and our velocity will always be less than the c value. So therefore, our n, because this number in the denominator will always be smaller than our c, our n always has to be greater than 1. So if you're encountering a problem where you have to calculate the index of refraction and you get a value less than 1, that means you screwed something up. Go back, try again. Okay. Um, for example, the n value in air is 1.000293. Notice that it's essentially 1 up to four significant digits. So really, it, the fact that we, when we've been doing our, uh, you know, calculations using three times ten to the eighth, um, as our speed of light and air, like that's a pretty good approximation. Okay, and so even though that was a little bit of a sneezing tree, it was kind of a, it was a reasonable sneezing tree. We've done, we've done worse. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and then also finally, n is dimensionless, and this makes sense. Uh, looking at this guy here, if you were going to say, well, what's the units on the speed of light? Well, the units are in meters per second, right? And then the units for velocity is also in meters per second, okay? And so anything divided by itself is just equal to 1. So this n value is dimensionless. There's no units on your n value. It's a ratio. It's a scalar quantity. All right. And then finally, this n value is a measure really of the optical density. All right. So this might confuse some of you for a second. So think about this. So when we talked about sound, okay, we talked about how sound travels at different speeds through different mediums. And we talked about how sound travels fastest through solids. And that makes sense because it, you know, it's literally this mechanical wave hitting these molecules together and it moves across. Uh, light does not act that way, right? Light creates its own medium-ish by creating, uh, by these overlapping, these um, uh, electric and magnetic fields, right? One goes up and then the other one goes like this. And so they kind of happen at the same time, right? Okay, and so you guys got this this thing that's going on at the same time, and so because that's occurring, your uh, your wave, your light, kind of gets inhibited 
inhibited when there's things in the way okay so because in a vacuum there's nothing in the way that's the fastest that light can go um, but then you know and so the uh, it kind of follows the general idea that the more dense your molecule is, or the sorry the more dense the material is the uh, the greater the end value um, it's not necessarily the greatest approximation there's uh, there's some big you know uh, problems with that approximation but it kind of generally follows that pattern uh, but specifically the end value is this optical density okay so it's um, the optical density is a, a way of quantifying like how permeable is it to electromagnetic radiation okay uh, so here's a bunch of different indexes of refraction notice that the solids are all higher than the liquids and then the liquids are all higher than the gases the solids are on the left liquids and then gases uh, and notice that all gases essentially have, uh, because gases are very, very far apart from one another, unless they're a colored gas, uh, they essentially uh, work, you know, um, they, they essentially are the same speed as uh, the speed in light or the speed in a vacuum. Okay. Uh, also notice that, you know, this is for specifically at these different temperatures. Okay. And then it's at 589 nanometers. Okay. Is the light that they used. All right. <clears throat> so effects of refraction. So we've got this cat trying to get this fish and they're looking at each other. Okay. So why is my, my PowerPoint is really struggling. Okay. So we've got this cat looking at this fish and we want to figure out, well, where does the cat see the fish? Well, we know that the ray that the cat sees of the fish is going to come from the fish down here, right? And it travels up here and then it gets refracted because, and it's going to get refracted at a greater angle from the normal because it's going to be traveling faster in air. And we know that because this value here water is 1.33 and air is 1.000293 so it travels faster in air than it does in water okay and so we can figure out where does the cat see the or the fish by taking a, a look at well the the cat is seeing this light and it's coming from here and our brains when we see light it doesn't you know it, it won't account for this index of refraction it comes as straight lines our brain approximate this image as a straight line so really the cats thinks that this ray is coming from this spot here somewhere around here and so we get the fish over here all right and so the the fish that the cat sees is actually above uh, the the actual location of the fish all right and then we can do the same thing with the fish here okay the fish the the ray that the fish sees from the cat Okay, it comes in here, and then because it's traveling slower in water, it gets reflected towards the normal. Okay, and then we can uh, just follow along. Well, this is the ray the cat or the fish sees, and so we could draw this up here, and then we'd have you know our cat up here. Okay, and this is where the you know the uh, the guy sees our cat. There's my little whiskers. All right. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. So the fish sees the cat further from the surface than the cat actually is. So that we can use these observed rays in order to turn, determine what is actually seen by the, the eyes that, of whatever creature might be looking at it, whether it's us as physicists or creatures trying to you know, feed their families. Okay. <clears throat> so this brings us to Snell's Law. And you're probably wondering yourself, all right, this is pretty good. I like this qualitative stuff, but really I want some some quantitative uh, material to really sink my teeth into to make this make sense. I'd like to do some math. I'm sure lots of you guys are saying that right now. And so here we have Snell's Law. And Snell's Law allows us to relate the indexes of refraction for uh, the two different materials and then the angles that it hits. Okay, And it's a really nifty formula, and it's really easy to use. We can just, the index of refraction of our incidence is equal, or times the sine theta of our incidence angle is equal to the index of refraction times the sine theta of refraction. All right, <clears throat> And so we can, as long as we're measuring them with respect to the normal, this is important. Okay, So as long as we're measuring this, essentially we can just plug things in, rearrange our equation, and Bob's your uncle. You're all done. All right, So let's do some practice problems here. It says, Find the angle of refraction of a light ray entering diamond from water at an angle of 30 degrees with the normal. Okay, so we're going to use uh, Snell's law because, well, that's, we just learned it. It'd be pretty silly for me to use a different equation than the one I just taught you. So we have uh, the incidence angle, or the incidence uh, index of refraction of the incidence times the sine theta incidence angle is equal to the index of refraction through the refracted medium times the sine theta of the refracted. 
Okay, and so it says find the angle of refraction. Well, this is the angle of refraction, this guy right here. So we're going to rearrange our equation to solve for theta r. All right, so we're going to divide both sides by n r. So n sub i times sine theta sub i over n sub r is equal to sine theta r. All right, so there's that. And then hopefully by now you've mastered your trick functions. And we can move this sign over here by taking the inverse sine of both sides. All right, so this guy would become, uh, we'd have the sine inverse of this whole thing over here. So it'd be n sub i sine theta sub i over n sub r. Okay, and that's equal to theta r. All right, and so that's that. So now we can just plug in our values. All right, so we need the n sub i and the n sub r. And so the uh, we are entering diamond from water. Okay, so we need water is our incidence, and then diamond is our reflected. So we'll go back here to this table. <clears throat> so diamond is 2.419, and water is 1.333. 2.419. So the diamond was 2.149, and the water was 1.333, and then our sine and our incidence angle here was 30 degrees. All right. Make sure your calculator is in um, degrees, not radians. Okay. So to get the sine inverse, we're just going to hit the second button on our calculator here, and then you're going to hit the sine button, which is right here. Okay, that guy right there. And then you should get like a nice little sine uh, to the negative one with the parentheses, and then you just plug in the rest. 1.333 times sine of 30 divided by 2.149. All right, and there you go. One point, oh, that's not right. Did I flip this over? Did I put these in the wrong spot? Entering diamond from water. Oh, am I in the wrong? No. Nope. Should be 16. Is it 419? Did I screw it up? 419. 419. A bunch of you guys are probably screaming at your computers for the last couple of minutes. Like, ah, Mr. McCloud. 419. All right. Let's try again. <clears throat> there we go. So, and then the 30 has uh, four sig figs. So our answer should be rounded to four. So we should get 15.99 degrees. Okay. So that's the refracted angle. Okay, again, notice that it's smaller than the initial, and that makes sense because water travels, or sorry, light travels uh, slower in diamond than it does in water. Okay, uh, let's try another one here. It says a light ray traveling through air strikes an unknown substance at 60 degrees and forms an angle of 41.42 at the normal inside. What is the material inside of it? All right, so <clears throat> again, we have our. Uh, Snell's law, n i sine theta i is equal to n r sine theta r. Okay, and we're looking for we're looking for this n r value so we can identify our material. All right, so we'll divide both sides by uh, sine theta r. So we're going to say n r n r is uh, equal to n i sine theta i over sine theta. R. All right, so the ni value, well, this is our incident uh, index of incidence, so that we're going from air into an unknown substance. So we need the index of refraction of air, 1.000293. All right, 1.000293. All right, and then that's times the incidence angle, so sine, uh, and it says strikes at 60 degrees. All right, so it's 60 divided by the sine of our refracted angle, which would be that 41.42. All right, so we have 1.000293 sine of 60 divided by sine of 41.42. All right, and we get 1.309, four sig figs, 1.309. So this is going to be our index of refraction for our mystery substance. So now we go back to our list and see if we can find 1.309. 
or at least one close to it. All right, so uh, ah, here it is, 1.309. So our substance would be ice at zero degrees Celsius. And just to make sure we did it right, we'll double check with the answer I got earlier. Boom. Nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Flashes, I don't know why. All right, so that's it right there. So um, go ahead and do your practice problems. Uh, this is very important, especially the Snell's Law stuff is important because as we move forward into lenses, you need to be able to take this material or take a Snell's Law and be able to apply it to be able to figure out what your angles are going to be as they move through uh, lenses and so on and so forth. So do your practice problems. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you on the flip side.